Well, good morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Today, a special day. It's the Lord's Day. It's Father's Day. We give thanks to the Lord for all his good gifts to us. Uh, we also thank uh, Jeff Arnold, seminarian, Jeff Arnold, for being here. He will be preaching with, uh, this morning uh, on the uh, Old Testament text, so we look forward to that. Before we get there, let's join our voices together singing our opening hymn, hymn number 908. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I have good news for you. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you. and For his sake, he forgives you all your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The intro for today is taken from Psalm 71. Be to me a rock of refuge, to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. I will also praise you with the heart of your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praises to you with the life of the Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also, which you have redeemed. in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Good. 
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Cast out all sins and evil desires from us and pour into our hearts your Holy Spirit to guide us into all blessedness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this morning is from Isaiah chapter 65, and it's also our sermon text for today. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat is in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me. I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their bosom both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills, I will measure into their bosom payment for their former deeds." Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it, so I will do for my servants' sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith that we proclaim. Our second reading comes from Galatians chapter 3. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the eighth chapter. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told him, <clears throat> told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country, the uh, Gerasenes, asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might uh, be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I'd like to invite the children and Ms. Reinhardt to come forward for our children's message for today. Hi, everybody. Can I have all of God's kids come up? for our message today. Hi. Is that some for little guys? Little kids and big kids. All right. Hi, everyone. How are we doing today? Good. So today is a special day. Can anyone tell me what day it is? Father's Day. It is Father's Day. (laughs) So last week, we talked about how God is three persons, but one God. Let's say this together. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Right. Not 
three gods, but one God. So I want you to listen to these words and tell me what they all have in common. Fruit Loops, Cheerios, Captain Crunch, and Wheaties. What do they all have in common? They're all circles. They're all circles. Well, th most of them are circles, but what types of food are they? They're types of cereal, that's right. So what, so what happens when you put in milk and cereal and it stays there for a long time? What happens to the cereal? It gets really soggy. So sometimes when that happens, it's hard to tell which part is the milk and which part is the cereal. So think of the cereal as us, as humans, and the milk as the world around us. So there are many awesome things that happen in the world, but there are also some icky things like bullying, hurting, lying, and cheating. So we are called to be different from the world because God is inside of us. So we should show each other love just as he has shown it to us. When we think of dad, you probably think of him as someone who helps you with your homework, maybe makes you dinner, plays outside with you, or comes to church with you, and most of all, he loves you, right? However, none of us are perfect and have probably done something that's made your dad a little bit upset. So what sorts of things do you think would make your dad upset? Can you tell me one or two things? Being naughty, right? If you, my dad is sitting right back there. If you asked him, he'd probably tell you a lot of things that have made him upset. <laughs> so there are lots of terrible things in the world. Just like we do things that disappoint our dads, sometimes we do things that disappoint God and make him sad. We can try and do better the next time. That, that is called repentance. Let's say repentance. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that might make him upset for a little bit, but then what does he do? He forgives you. Right. So we always have to remember that Jesus will forgive us. He wants us to repent. Like yesterday, I, I, there was one more chicken. Oh, that's okay. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, did it come back? That's good. <laughs> he caught it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so we always have to remember that Jesus will always, loves, will always love us. He died on the cross for our sins and rose again so we can live in heaven with him. So let's fold our hands and pray. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for showing me the right way to go. Help me to share your love with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. You can go back to your seats.
grace, mercy, and peace to us in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, today's message comes from our Old Testament reading with special emphasis on these words from Isaiah chapter 65 and verses 6 and 7. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but will repay. I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord, because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. This prophecy comes at the end of the book of Isaiah, and in these last chapters, beginning with chapter 59, God speaks to his chosen people words of both judgment and redemption. In these final chapters, God condemns but shows mercy. He is vengeful yet proclaims the year of his favor. He judges but redeems and saves. And the point of all this is that God is just. He judges and condemns those who have turned away from him, and he saves those who remain true. For his servant's sake, for his chosen, for those who seek him and call to him, they shall possess the land and the mountains with pasture for their flocks and a place for their herds to lie down. Take note, the good end happily and the bad unhappily. According to Oscar Wilde, that is what is meant by fiction. But with God, this is no fiction. This is his true justice, and he will bring it to bear. Friends, we see here how the Lord is good to those who serve him and honor him, who fear and respect him. But also we see how men respond to his mercy and loving kindness. That is, with ingratitude and unfaithfulness, with disobedience and disrespect, and those who are unfaithful to him will know his wrath. He promises both judgment and mercy, even from the time of the Israelites' flight from Egypt during the Exodus. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing grace and every blessing to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. But we ask ourselves, is it right for God to punish the children for the sin of the fathers? But in answer to this question, I have unfortunate news. As the Bible affirms from the beginning to the end, and it is quite clear, and as our own life experiences testify, the sin of the fathers becomes the sin of the sons and the children. It is not a mere threat from God that he'll deliver punishment upon the children. Certainly he will. But when it comes time for that, they'll have deserved every bit of it. And this is because they're born into the ways of their fathers and trained in those ways. It's called enculturation. Think about it. When it comes to living within a particular culture, we're all like Cheerios and milk, as we heard before. How long does it take before the Cheerios that are sitting in a bowl become just like the milk? You can't tell a difference between the cereal and the milk. That milk is our culture. And when we sit in the bowl and we absorb it until one day can heart, you can't even tell the difference between us and that culture, between our thoughts and culturally popular thoughts, between our worldview and culturally popular worldviews. That culture is handed down to us from our forebears, our fathers, and we're handing it down to our own children. Let's look in our passage at the practices that the Hebrew children inherited from their fathers. Isaiah 65, starting right about verse 2, the second portion. They walk in ways that are not good. They follow their own devices. They provoke God to his face continually. They sacrifice in gardens. They make offerings on bricks. They sit in tombs, spending the night in secret places, eating pig's flesh and vessels of tainted meat. The significance of some of these things may be lost on us today. Sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks is kind of obscure. But what Isaiah is talking about is idol worship. Sitting in tombs, spending the night in secret places, these refer to death cult practices and necromancy. And we know that the Jewish people aren't allowed to eat pork. All these they do anyway. 
And all these sins culminate in this last one there in verse 5. I'll pull it out again. They say to God, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. Yes, they're too holy for God. They have better ideas. And this is the attitude people get when they no longer listen to God, but to their own voices instead. They become gods unto themselves. They claim to know, without any counsel from the word of God, right from wrong, good from bad, just from unjust. Now here, during the time that Isaiah is prophesying, the people are mixing with other nations and ethnicities. These, they, they do not follow the Lord, but they follow other gods instead. And they're introducing those foreign gods into their own worship. They know better than to think there's only one way to salvation. They say, there are many gods here that very fine people worship in very sincere ways. They know better than to think that they must comply with God's law. They say, surely a righteous God will not punish an innocent person. They know better than to trust his word and his promises. They say, what has this God done for us lately? Why should we fear him? When have we ever seen his judgment? God promises here in this passage to judge such persons and to measure just payment into their laps. And what we see here is a principle at work. What is that principle? Well, in illustration, I'll call to mind a government anti-smoking campaign from the late 60s and early 70s. Some of you might remember it. It showed scenes of a father and a son doing things together, throwing the ball in the park, washing the car, fixing a lawnmower, whatever it was. The voiceover, the narrator says, like father, like son. But suddenly we're jarred with the image of that kid reaching over and grabbing a cigarette from his dad's pack, putting it to his lips and pretending to smoke. That's the principle here. Like father, like son. And as I was saying before, it's not just that God has proclaimed this, that he will repay both the people's iniquities and their father's iniquities together, but it's absolutely inherent to the way God created nature itself. Our children learn from us. They use us as examples. And they live in the culture we create. We bear responsibility for them, and we are responsible to them, and not just to them, but to the world they inhabit, and to the world that their children will inhabit. They suffer for our iniquities when we fail to teach them what is right, good, and salutary, and so will their children. And we can all look back to the last century, see a lot of things going wrong. What was it? War, rebellion, moral decay. And we see how those things have contributed to the mess our world is in right now. And it shows us just how important it is that fathers train up their children in the way that they should go. Now, I was going to go through a whole litany of things that are wrong with this world, but I suspect that we all know them pretty well already. I will say that I'm often very disturbed when I go back and recollect on my former self. Some of you in this congregation knew me before I was a Christian. I thought I was a pretty good person. I was sober, I worked hard, I was fair in my judgments, I didn't steal, lie, or cheat, but sometimes, every once in a while, I'll catch sight of a movie that I had seen back then, or some television show that I used to watch, and I thought it was all right. It really isn't. I'm amazed at how awful this stuff is, how scandalous the content is. I never recognized it before because I was in that culture. I hadn't been separated from it. I was that Cheerio, soaking in the culture and becoming conformed to it. I was partnered with the culture, for at one time I was in darkness, and here I'm channeling St. Paul in Ephesians. For one time I was in darkness, and I was taking part in unfruitful works of darkness, not looking carefully how I walked, not making the best use of my time. And the days were evil. The days were evil, and I was not walking, paying attention to how I was walking. Believe me, with respect to evil days, things haven't exactly gotten any better since the 60s and 70s. We live in a decadent world. The Bible, from first to last, attests to this fact. The world began to decay from the moment of the fall, and men's efforts to reverse this trend are and will be futile. 
and against the principalities and powers of this world, namely the devil and all of his minions, our weapons are useless. Useless. To suggest otherwise is to call God a liar. The false gospel of social justice, that is, justice based on the values of men, is a lie. The false gospel of coexistence or ecumenicalism, that is, a gospel based on the idea that all paths lead to the same God, that is a lie. The false gospel of some kind of man-made peace on earth is a lie. Mankind is not capable of overcoming Satan. Mankind is not even interested in overcoming Satan. Mankind is a friend to Satan who wreaks havoc on this earth and will continue to do so until the end of days. And men are no longer ashamed of their wickedness. They used to fear God, and when their evil deeds were exposed in the light, they scurried like cockroaches. Now, if you can imagine walking into a room, everybody's walked into a cockroach-infested room, turn on the light and seen them scurry. Can you imagine them? You turn on the light, they just sit there? What? You know? They're moving their shameful deeds into the light where everyone can see, without shame, with no fear of God's wrath. And dare we say that they fully expect you to get on board with their program. This is the expectation they have. Look at all the things our society now does in the name of good. They call it good. And tell me, does God appreciate this? Does he appreciate it? When we encourage, when we encourage women to murder their own children in the womb. Not just allow it, encourage it. Does he appreciate it when we deliberately confuse our children as they wrestle with their already confused notions of who they are in the world? their sexuality, and what is the difference between right and wrong? Deliberately confuse them. Does he appreciate it when we, we reject his created order and create instead an altogether new concept of ourselves, confusing gender roles, and all based on how we, not he, identifies us? Our own brand new inventions. How does this not look like walking in ways that are not good? following our own devices, and provoking God to his face continually. We are apparently too holy for God. We have better ideas. And this is the attitude we get when we no longer listen to God, but to our own voices instead. We become gods unto ourselves. We claim to know without any counsel from God and the word of God, right from wrong, good from bad, just from unjust, we know better than to think that there's only one way to salvation. We know better than to think that we must comply with God's law. And we know better than to trust his word and his promises. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. This is our application of the text today. These iniquities of the Israelites are also our iniquities. They come to us directly from our fathers who handed us down the ways of men instead of the ways of God. And God is measuring payment into our laps, and he's doing it right now. The iniquity, the wrongdoing, this is the punishment itself. We become trapped in our own vices. God removes his protective hedge from around us and gives us over to our own base desires. As it is written, and this is right from Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What can be known about God is plain to us because we have been shown and we are without excuse. We have not honored God or given thanks to him. We have become futile in our thinking and our foolish hearts are darkened. Claiming to be wise, we are fools. And God has given us up to the lusts of our hearts and to impurity, to the dishonoring of our bodies among one another in dishonorable passions, women exchanging natural relations for those contrary to nature, and men likewise committing shameless acts with one another. And even though we know God's righteous decree and that those who practice such things deserve the ultimate punishment, 
And I will refer you to the final verse of Romans 1 to find out what that punishment is and what we deserve. We not only do them ourselves, but we give approval to those who do. Give approval to those who do. What in the name of God are we celebrating? I suspect that we're celebrating our independence from God. And this is what we're proud of in Pride Month. That we know better how to care for our neighbor and love him than God does. If we love them so much, why don't we warn them of the wrath to come? You know, tell them the truth. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. In giving us our passage from the prophet Isaiah today, the Lord does not have in mind some sappy, sweet Father's Day message where we raise our fathers up on a pedestal and extol their many virtues. Many of us have had, or by the grace of God still have, fine fathers. Virtuous and balanced men, upright, who deserve a lot of credit for the people that we are today. And we're thankful for that. We are certainly thankful for that. Some of us may not have had that particular experience, and that is certainly a pity. But whichever is the case, those men were and are, like us, all sinners. And those sins are coming home to roost more and more rapidly as every day, month, and year wear on toward that final day of judgment to come. And this world is coming to an end. And it will be judged. It is moving surely and inexorably toward its final moment when Christ will come again. It's not going to be pretty. It certainly isn't very pretty right at the present moment. It will, however, be glorious. Those of us who heed his word, who have been baptized, believe on Christ and pray. We are those who shall inherit the new heavens and the new earth, just like those at the end of our passage in Isaiah, that remnant who shall have pasture for their flocks and a place for their herds to lie down. We shall find our eternal home. But we must, as Christians... We must recognize our sin. We must acknowledge it and come clean. We must know it and we must confess it. In the name of Christ, I call upon us all to repent. Repent. Christ suffered and died on the cross to pay for our sins, which are many. Even though we've made a mess of this world that he created and in our attempts to make it better by our own machinations, we just continue to make a horrible mess of it. Through our confession and repentance, we are absolved of those sins through the glory of Jesus Christ. Alleluia. He rose again from the dead, thus proving that he is the Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He now sits at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subjected to him. Unlike ours, his weapons are not useless against evil, and he wields them with power and might to defend us from all danger and to guard and protect us from all evil. We pray. Dear Father in heaven, on this Father's Day, make us better fathers to our children and better stewards of this world. We want to cast off our rebellious nature. We want to serve you in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. We want to be rescued from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputation, to experience in our final hours a blessed end and to be taken from this valley of sorrow to you in heaven. This you promise to do for us who repent and believe, who have been baptized into your name and who call upon it in faith and confidence, trusting that you alone provide all good things and that you show mercy to your beloved. Pray, give us the wisdom and the courage to raise our children in the light of your truth and to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand. Together we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for all people in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the nations of the earth, that civil leaders would repent of their rebellion against God's will and perform justice by defending the weak and punishing the guilty, that the church may have free course to preach the gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, that like, man, like the man formerly possessed by demons, she may boldly proclaim how much Jesus has done for her. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For earthly fathers, that our father from whom all fatherhood is named would give them uh, confidence in their station and zeal for their tasks, that he'd make them examples to their children of godly life and love for his world that he would bless their work and bring, uh, to bring up children in the fear and instruction of the Lord, that he would give them their comfort of his absolution over their shortcomings. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the nations and those who govern them, for our own country and leaders, for our cities and communities, for good laws and faithful citizens, and for the common welfare of us all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Jean Albers, Pat Ballou, Dom Cuffia, Jan Donham, Linda Gantz, Reverend Martin Holman, Riley Kirkey, uh, Becky Marks, Charlotte Reese, Mary Sisko, Don Weaver, Diane Wilkinson, Wilma Wampler, Tom Zimmerman, Tim Crouch, Reverend Jeff Geisler, Luann Lybrook, Judy Van Osdell, and Errol Hassan, father of Shirin Hassan Gilbert, and all who have requested our prayer that Jesus would attend to the afflictions that beset them as he pitied the man afflicted with the abundance of demons. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Sarah Hoffman and Bradley Davis, who were united in holy matrimony at this altar yesterday, that the Lord would bless their marriage and hold them together as one. And for the continued blessing of 45 years of marriage, celebrated today by Mark and Diane Riggins, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Dear Father, you know the condition of our souls, that we frequently wander into sins, vice, and danger. Hear our prayers for the sake of Christ, who defeated legions of demons so that we might receive adoption as sons. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we gather now our tithes and offerings, I invite you to take a moment and indicate your presence in the fellowship paths located at the end of the pews.
remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. I trust that today's uh, service was to point us to Christ, who is uh, gracious and merciful, uh, but who is also just, and calls us to live a life of repentance and faith to him. A couple of announcements for today as we make our way. Um, for all of you who were involved in spirit camp in one way, shape, or form, would you please stand up? Servant teens, adult leaders. We had 72 campers with us this week from 8.30 in the morning till about 2.30 in the afternoon. We had 62 adults and servant teens who served with joy over these last four days for Spear Camp or our Vacation Bible School. And uh, we give thanks to God for your service and your role to play in that. <clears throat> 
You guys may be seated. Thank you again for your service. One of the things that we do at Spirit Camp and have done for 20-some years, I think, has been Operation Christmas Child, where the campers put together these shoe boxes. Uh, there's notes, there's toys, there's all, a whole bunch of things in there. They get sent to uh, children uh, overseas, and they open them up, and they're uh, greeted with, with the, these gifts and these messages of encouragement in, in Christ. And, um, and we have 80 of them uh, that were completed over the last four days. If you'd like to take part in sending those uh, 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 for Operation Christmas Child, the shipping cost is about $9 a box. And uh, Drew, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here. There's a okay. little basket out there, a, a, a plate. If you have that, um, Drew would just take a, a, a door collection for, for anyone who would like to give uh, in sending those. Reminder, going forward uh, this week, we have uh, Wednesday at 6.30 in the morning, Cloverleaf South. Our Bible study resumes, and uh, we're looking at Second Peter. And then uh, we also have an opportunity, two opportunities coming up. One is a celebration and remembrance of life of Joanne Alcott. Um, that will be Sunday, July 17th. That will be at the convention center. And then also a safe sleep education opportunity at Sherwood Oaks, and that is July 20th. The seminarian Jeff Arnold, thank you for being here uh, this Sunday, and uh, in beginning July, you will be Vicar Jeff Arnold in Columbia City, uh, uh, Indiana, so up near Fort Wayne. So the Lord's blessings on that new uh, role as vicar as well. Thank you for being with us. With that, go in peace as you serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.